Welcome, dear viewer, to another episode of Moby Dick Abridged, or who cares what Eli thinks about Moby Dick. I, of course, am your host, Eli, who cares what I think, and this is episode four of Moby Dick Abridged, in which we will cover chapter four of Moby Dick, The Counterpain. And as we learned in a previous chapter, counterpain is a nice old-timey word, for a blanket or a bedspread. So yeah, this chapter is named after a blanket, which doesn't sound all that interesting, I'll grant you. But to be fair, it's not really about a blanket at all. Uh, I mean, there is a blanket. Well, you'll see. Anyway, for now, dear viewer, thank you for joining me. And without any further ado, let's discuss a rather short chapter of Moby Dick, chapter four, The Counterpane. If you recall the end of the last episode, dear viewer, Ishmael gets into bed with Queequeg and gets the best night's sleep of his life. Chapter 4 begins with him waking up with Queequeg's arm wrapped around him lovingly, like a, like a spooning, like, a, like Ishmael's the little spoon and Queequeg is the big spoon, and they were very comfy and cozy in bed. And according to Ishmael, the pattern on the blanket, uh, the counterpane, and the pattern, uh, the tattoo... Uh, and Queequeg's arm sort of blend together in this really cool sort of way to point uh, to the point, I mean, where um, you can't really tell which is which in the early morning light, you know? He's, like, discussing how he can't tell whether he's looking at the at the arm or the blanket, which is pretty cool. Uh, must be pretty neat looking. Anyway, Queequeg is still asleep, and Ishmael tries to get up without waking him up, but he can't. So eventually he shouts, and Queequeg gets up and volunteers to get dressed first so Ishmael can have the room to himself uh, when he gets ready for the day, which is extraordinarily charitable and kind of Queequeg. Uh, but before he managed to wake Queequeg up, however, Ishmael describes uh, what I believe is supposed to be what we'd call uh, his arm being asleep um, in our terminology. I'm not sure how if they had that phrase, you know, my hand's asleep or whatever, uh, in 1850. But that's what it sounds like he's saying. Uh, he wakes up at the beginning of the chapter and like the circulation has been lightly cut off and his hand is numb. Uh, but then he recalls this memory from his childhood when he got in trouble on the longest day of the year. How unfortunate. And uh, had to go to bed at two o'clock in the afternoon. And after staying in bed for some 16 hours, he woke up with the same sort of sensation with his hand asleep. It's an interesting sort of little tangent. It almost reminds me of something from like Swan's Way by Marcel Proust, where he'll just sort of remember some shit and like reminisce about it for like a page or two. <laughs> but in any case, everybody's up now. And uh, we get this moment after Queequeg offers to get dressed uh, first so Ishmael can have privacy, where Ishmael very much in the parlance of his times, which once again is 1850s racist times so bear that in mind but he's he's coming to some realizations that we really take for granted in this day and age um <clears throat> and he's like sort of expressing himself in what would be what would have been normal like normal terminology for when he lived so keep that in mind during this quote you'll see what i mean it's like a modern idea but it's expressed in like a like a Thomas Jefferson sort of vernacular. So it kind of strikes the ear a little bit weird. Uh, it's strange to our modern sensibilities, but for the time in the 1850s, this must have been pretty mind blowing to people when they read it. Thinks I Queequeg under the circumstances, this is a very civilized overture, but the truth is these savages have an innate sense of delicacy. Say what you will. It is marvelous how essentially polite they are. I pay this particular compliment to Queequeg because he treated me with so much civility and consideration while I was guilty of great rudeness, staring at him from the bed and watching all his toilette motions, for the time my curiosity getting the better of my breeding. Nevertheless, a man like Queequeg you don't see every day. He and his ways are well worth unusual regarding. Which, I mean, doesn't excuse you from just spying on him and not revealing that you're in the bed already. But whatever, you know, I mean, he's like saying, like, this guy is not uh, your average protractor. 
He's a little uh he's a little obtuse. But Ishmael appreciates that about him. I mean, Queequeg is like the most uh upstanding, morally uh uh unambiguously good character in this whole story, pretty much. Not that I mean there are a lot of people that don't do anything wrong, really. But Queequeg definitely is uh the shit. So he's not wrong about Queequeg being um uh, not your average bloke, right? So anyway, Ishmael is sort of like uh, Oscar Schindler or something in this in this one regard. He's realizing the humanity of another group of people, a group of people who he's taken for granted as subhuman in some way. And he points out that it's interesting to see that Queequeg has adopted some Western customs into his lifestyle. For example, he wears shoes, uh, which... Uh, Herman Melville, having been l actually in his real life to the South Pacific, I guess he would know whether that was uh, common there. And uh, he says it's not. Uh, unlike the norm, yeah, he wears boots, like I said, unlike the norm for where he comes from. And um, he's learned just enough to behave in this like truly bizarre way, according to Ishmael. Like he puts his shoes on, fine, but he also insists on doing that unseen like in private he won't put his shoes on in front of you so he gets under the bed in order to put on his boots and Ishmael's like that's so so strange he like knows just enough of our ways to like act really weird <laughs> when he enacts them so anyway sort of a strange sort of comment but that's it and then Queequeg washes his hands his arms and his chest and he shaves his face with the blade of his harpoon which is incredibly badass and sort of seems impractical but ishmael does point out that once like later on like at first he thought it was weird but then later on uh he found out how sharp they keep those uh harpoons and he was like okay that makes sense <laughs> it's sharp enough to shave with so yeah uh queequeg is a total badass who shaves his face with a fucking whale harpoon and and that's about it he walks out of the room with his harpoon in his hand like a marshal's baton which is a reference to a military rank called field marshal. And uh, it's usually the highest rank attainable in a military. And traditionally, the field marshal carries a baton as a symbol of their office. So Queequeg is carrying the harpoon in a very sort of official, almost regal, maybe even authoritative way, as opposed to authoritarian. Um, there is a gravitas to him in his harpoon, so to speak. And that, dear viewer, is how chapter four, The Counterpane, ends with Queequeg getting ready and leaving the room. It's a very short one, but we get to see Queequeg behaving in the most civilized way of any character in the book. Again, remember the way he invites Ishmael into bed uh, in the last chapter? He's so sincere and wonderful. Love Queequeg. And he shaves his fucking face with a goddamn harpoon. How badass is that? But yeah, only five pages long, and uh, sometimes that's just how it be in Moby Dick. You'll have a 15-page chapter where like 10 different little micro events happen, and you'll meet tons and tons of characters and hear about paintings and shit, and then the next one is five pages long, and it's all in one room, and half of it is one character remembering having his arm fall asleep when he was a kid and trying to wake the other guy up. <laughs> and that's that's just how Moby Dick do. But we love it. And with that in mind, dear viewer, I want to thank you for watching and invite you back for next time when we will cover Chapter 5, Breakfast. See you then.